The Book Guys Show is brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com slash bookguys and get a free book just for signing up for a free trial. This is the Book Guys Show, episode 68. We're back for another week of books, audiobooks, audio dramas, and podcasts. And the prodigal father has returned. <laughs> we have a full panel today. Professor Allen's going to join us later. But joining us all the way from Washington, the father himself, Father Robert Ballister, the digital Jesuit. How are you, sir? It's, uh, I'm good, and it's great to be back. I, 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 I'm really, really sorry. I missed one week because I was just horribly, horribly sick, and then I mixed the next week because I was up in the air. It's, you know, it's how I'm my life goes. just getting over a flu myself. I know how you feel, my friend. Uh, the, the, it just, it, it's this new flu, this, the flu for the season. You get over it quick, but then it just kind of hangs it's, on. It's, it's some good cough. stuff. It's some good Ugh. stuff, I tell you. And speaking of sick, <laughs> Sir Jimmy, all the way in North Carolina, he's got his cup of noodle. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, people. Some people say it makes you sick, but I, I swear it's the only thing that makes me better. Yeah, chicken. You know what? The standard chicken noodle uh, in a cup or uh, Vietnamese pho soup will do it for you as well. Good stuff. <laughs> and we have a special guest all the way from Connecticut, which apparently is a state. I think I don't know. I'm Canadian. I'm an idiot. <laughs> we got Jeff Gurner. How you doing, Jeff? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. We, we were just saying last week, Jeff, that, uh, you know, we've all listened to so many of your stories, you know, including uh, Kill Decision, all this other this Suarez novels and just having a great time. You know, you literally, uh, you know, told me uh, bedtime stories for many, many weeks. <laughs> I actually had to take a Jeff Gruner break. <laughs> so this week, I'm not going to be talking about uh, any books from uh, read by yourself because I had to take a break. It was too much Jeff Gruner. Sound like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we usually start off, Jeff, by asking uh, what people have been doing, what's new, what's on their Kindles, what's on their iPads, on their Androids. I see that, uh, <laughs> I see that, Padre, on your Android device now and on your iPad. Uh, we were talking about it last week. I think Craig Dalmo may have gone by Bezos' house <laughs> and said, "Hey, Bezos, what's with the crappy apps?" Just like he said. <laughs> Because it turns out this week the Audible app did get updated on the iPad, and we'll talk about that later in the show. Uh, but, but let's start off with what you've been reading. What's going on, Padre? We haven't seen you in a while. What's uh, on your I, Kindle? I, I, I'm almost reluctant to say this, but um, so shades of gray. Shades of gray. On, I... No. Okay. Sorry. I thought it was uh, shades of gray. Oh gosh, no. no. <laughs> Although I will do. I will get to that eventually. No. Uh, the, so the last time I was on, I, I was really big into a Green Lantern kick. I was getting back into my uh, graphic novel roots. But since then, um, I may have been influenced by my sister, and I've started reading the <clears throat> Hunger Games trilogy by oh. Suzanne <laughs> okay. Collins. Um, I say that with a little bit of shame, because I had been making fun of that series for the longest time, and now that I'm reading it, I'm actually getting kind of into it. <laughs> it's, you know, that's like me with the Harry Potter series, you know, <sighs> everyone was making fun of me, and I'm kind of making fun of myself, and I've read the first one, and then the second, and third, and fourth. And yeah, I'm kind of hating myself, but I'm enjoying <laughs> it. It's a guilty pleasure. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> have you, have you seen the movie, Padre? The first movie? I, I have not seen the movie. Uh, in fact, I deliberately didn't see the movie. I said, I, if, if I'm going to watch the movie, I'm going to read the book first. And now that I've read the book, I actually really want to see the movie. Yeah. And, and I, I want to see the second, because I finished the second book, and I really want to see the movie for the second book. And this is how addictions start, and we have to head them <laughs> off when they're early. That's right. We do. Hey, Sir Jimmy, anything new on your plate, or have you just been uh, sleeping off the flu? Oh, no. I... Um... I just picked up Meth Land. It's uh, it's not a new book by any means by uh, Nick Redding about uh, the destruction of uh, the flyover country in the United States by a horrible drug. But I, I'm actually got it right here on the iPad, the the brand new Audible app. I like it a lot. I'm sitting here looking. Kill Decision, read by Jeff Gurner. Freedom, read by Jeff Gurner. Damon, read by Jeff Gurner. And I wonder why when I download new podcasts, it says that I'm about totally out of space on my 16 gig yes. ipad i've got quite a few big books on here yeah they do take up a lot of room you can there's a setting in the audible app where you can set it to a normal setting from the very high or the high quality and it, it saves space but then it sounds a little crappy sorry there's only <laughs> one way to listen to jeff Gardner, and that's in high quality that's right baby <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i finished well. uh i finished 14 by peter Kleins, a science fiction slash horror 
Uh, that was a lot of fun. I'll talk about that later. And uh, I'll also be talking about the next book I got on Audible, uh, which is Red Shirts by John Scalzi, read by Will Wheaton. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. If you're a Star Trek fan, that's a, we'll talk about that later as well. But uh, Jeff Gurner, my friend, what, what does the audiobook narrator read? <laughs> well, uh, the last book that I, I finished, uh, just wrapped up last week, was uh, Stephen King's uh, 11 22 uh, I'm a huge, huge, huge Stephen King fan from since I was just a, a tyke. And uh, finally got around to reading that one, and it, it blew me away. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I think I read it in a day, like literally yeah. on a Sunday in a, in a chair in the summer. It, it was uh, just, it wasn't summer, it was winter. I was outside in my back patio doing barbecue, I think. And I read the whole thing. It's brilliant. Right Can't wait. Uh, there's a movie, I believe, coming on that one as well. Are there? I think that would work well as a movie, obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself. You are an audiobook narrator. I know you're, you've, you've done acting and television. Uh, you've done work in video games. I mean, you just have an interesting IMDb page. Yeah, uh, well, I am... Um you know, I probably actor, killed you. Uh, I killed you in Grand Theft Auto, I'm sure, at some point. <laughs> it's funny you said that. I, uh, the, the very first video game that I did was a uh, title called Max Payne a long time ago. And uh, I remember my little brother called me up and said, uh, oh, my God, it was great. I killed you. And then I went back and killed you every way that you could possibly kill you. So, uh, but, uh, I think he was getting back a little payback. So, um, But, no, I'm, I'm, I'm an actor. Um, uh you know, uh, largely I started my career out doing uh, the theater, um, which was all I thought I ever wanted to do. And I've worked on Broadway and off-Broadway and, and regional theaters all over the country. And I've, uh, you know, acted on stages internationally. And uh, I, I started pursuing voiceovers um, early in my career and, and largely just did, um, uh, you know, commercials, uh, uh, promos, uh, television and radio. And uh, uh then I was fortunate enough to uh, audition for an audio book um, called The Keep, which was my first one. And uh, uh, it uh, was very well received. And uh, we won a, uh, what is it called? A, a Golden golden Earphones Award? Okay. I think it's the Golden Earphones Award. At any rate, that sort of uh, uh, um, launched me into audio book world. And, uh, you know, that's uh, been a really rewarding part of the uh, uh, my larger career as an actor now for uh, about five or six years, I guess I've really been doing them. So. What does that mean? Does that mean like it's two blocks away from Broadway and when it's off, off Broadway, how far <laughs> does that stretch? <laughs> a long, long way. No, I, you know, actually, um, basically the, the way uh, those definitions are broken down is, is based on the contract you're working and of course the theater in which you're working. Um, uh, I, I could be wrong on the numbers, but uh, for a show to become an off-Broadway show, um, it, it has something to do with the number of seats uh, in the theater. And um, so a theater is designated as an off-Broadway theater or a Broadway theater. And, uh, you know, obviously the Broadway theaters are all in one district uh, in, in New York. And, um, you know, I, I think it might be somewhere around a thousand seats and up and you, you can't call it an off-Broadway show. But the rest of that is... Uh, basically dictated on the contract that you sign. Um, Off-Broadway uh, pays considerably less than Broadway. And then off-off-Broadway, I think um, uh, that covers just about any other theater <laughs> that you're doing in New York that's uh, not in a uh, certified off-Broadway or Broadway theater. Well, so. Jeff, right now you're off-off-off-off-off-Broadway. So. <laughs> and so far I'm in Connecticut. Checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I noticed you did a, a Kill Decision, Daniel Suarez. That was uh, uh, Sir Jimmy started with that one, and you did a lot of the, the work for uh, Daniel Suarez. I mean, how many books did you do in in his series there? Uh, well, I've I've done three of his books now. Um, you know, the first one was was Demon, Demon. Uh, which was part of a a, a two parter. Uh, the second one was called Freedom. That was the yeah. first week I spent with you, listening was, to oh, you. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> and and we enjoyed the time together. Yes. Um, it was kind so of one-sided. Okay, it was a little one-sided, but all right, whatever. <laughs> I was there for you. <laughs> um, but so that was a, a two-parter, uh, Demon and then Freedom. Um, and I couldn't wait. I, we, we finished up Demon and then, um, uh, you know, I had to wait however many years it was before he uh, came out with the sequel, which was uh, 
equally fabulous. And uh, and then they were kind enough uh, um, to use me again on on the book he followed those up with, which was uh, Kill Decision. Kill Decision. Yeah, which now, was uh, uh, was great. Uh, Jeff, if you don't mind me asking, uh, so in uh, in uh, Demon, that was just you, right? I mean, uh, you you were using different character voices for uh, the, for the various characters, and then when they got to Freedom, they brought in one or two other voice actors. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I know that in, in Demon, the first book, um, the entire narrative was was me. Uh, although there was another actress uh, who uh, read on it named Garrett Scott. And uh, Garrett did some of the um, Angie, some of the just little intro pieces that happened. Oh, uh, right, right, right. You know, before each chapter yeah, and the some little, of the uh, newscasters the news and casting, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, but I, I don't recall if uh, I don't think Garrett was in on on the second book. I think that was just me on uh, on Freedom. Because I, I remember in Demon, uh, you doing the voice of Angie and uh, Anderson, and I really enjoyed it. I, I liked uh, the way it sounded, and I was like, okay, yeah, that's how that's how I would do a voice. Oh, and right then in, in Freedom, it sounded like they were using a, uh, an actual an actual woman. It had like the woman's uh, an actual female tenor to it. No, I, I don't think so. I, I may really? have just I may have just been that. You range. were just that good, just that rangy and good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't think so. As, as I recall, Freedom, uh, uh, freedom was uh, was just me. Hmm? Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> I still don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> my, my stock woman voice. <laughs> Uh, you've got a lot of great stuff on Audible, and uh, I always remind people that they can search Audible by uh, audiobook narrator. But then you end up, you know, spending a month with Jeff Kerner. It's, it's just <laughs> going to happen if you try any of his books. Uh, it's very, a good time. Very well read. And your latest book uh, that you've narrated uh, is by uh, Gene Wentz and Bia Belgeris called Men in Green Faces, a novel of U.S. Navy SEALs. I don't know if that's the latest one you read. Yeah. It's, it's got to be pretty close. It's it's one of the more recent ones that I did. Yeah, it, uh, it was um, uh, Gene Wentz was uh, uh, actually was a, a Navy SEAL who fought during Vietnam and um, wrote this fictional account. I imagine of some of his very real experiences, and uh, uh, it was extraordinary. It was, it was really an exciting book to work on because um, uh, you know he he puts you right in at the main character. Uh, you know. Is has been deployed and is uh, doing his duty, and uh, you follow him just toward the end of, of uh, this deployment, um, and uh, him and, and and his platoon, uh, you know, and follow them through uh, through their missions, and uh, it's it's incredibly uh, realistic. I, you know, obviously drawn on his own uh, experiences, but. Uh, you felt like you were right there with him. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't just bang, bang, shoot, shoot. Uh, it, it was really a, about the emotional investment, too. So really an exciting book to work on. If you don't mind, we'll talk a little bit more about Men in Green Faces. I'm going to play a little clip uh, from Audible. And uh, when we return, uh, Professor Allen will join us after the break. But I'm, I'm going to play a little clip of uh, Jeff Gurner himself uh, reading Men in Green Faces. The deadliest men in Vietnam's Mekong Delta were operating. Deep inside the triple canopied jungle, Brian, at point, held up a clenched fist. The silent stop-look-listen signal passed from point down the line to Gene and back to Doc in the rear. The seven seals froze, ten feet apart, seeing what wasn't supposed to be there, what wasn't on any map. Gene his M60 aimed wherever he looked, smelled death, looked at death. His chest and throat tightened, adrenaline pumping. One step forward out of the jungle where he stood invisible in the green shadow, and he'd be in there. The 60 moved very slowly, poised like a cobra. The SEAL squad had inserted into the jungle hours earlier after being taken nine miles upriver by boat into enemy territory. From their insertion point into the NVA secret zone, they'd patrolled to within two and a half clicks of the mission objective, an NVA rest and recovery center. Progress had been slow. Well-trained, all with hard target combat experience, they'd snaked through dense jungle, weapons off safe, locked and loaded, never disturbing the natural sounds of the environment. 
The seals secured everything metal with green duct tape and made sure they moved quietly. Now, they almost didn't breathe. And we're back. Jeff, that was awesome. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> Professor, I had to take a little break there because Professor Allen's going to join us. Hello, Professor. How are you doing? Hello, my book peeps. <laughs> hey, I wanted to ask you, Professor. We're, so we're talking to Jeff Ger Gerner. I had to get you in because I know you want to talk to him as well. What's that tapestry behind you? That is so cool. That is, it is, uh, of course, cat related. Okay. It's a tapestry of cats in all variety of positions, including a... Uh, Including one that's uh, that's uh, a cat in a library on books, so it's it, nice. It's appropriate. It fits. It's it fits. appropriate. <laughs> and and the cat herself is floating around here somewhere. So. Yeah, she'll she'll show up later in the podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> so we're continuing talking to Jeff Gerner and and uh, talking about men in green faces. So uh, how often, Jeff, do you get to meet some of the authors? Because I know some audiobook narrators do get to work with them, some don't, and it, it really depends on the author and the locations if they work out. Uh, uh you know, it's uh, it kind of just depends. I've actually myself reached out to a couple of the authors uh, uh, whom I've narrated, um, you know, just to let them know that uh, you know, aside from doing the work, I, I, I became a fan. Uh, I've gone back and forth with uh, with Daniel Suarez a few times. Uh, couldn't be a nicer guy. Um, and uh, should I ever find myself in L.A., I, I hope that we get to uh, grab a drink or two. Um, one of my favorite authors uh, uh, who I met is uh, Karen Miller, who um, wrote uh, half of a series of uh, Star Wars books that I did uh, for the Clone Wars. And, uh, uh, you know, she's an Australian and um, she uh, she reached out to me and, and introduced herself and uh, uh, then got in touch when she was coming out to visit New York. And uh, uh, we got together to have some lunch with uh, Kevin Thompson, who was the director of, uh, of that series. And uh, and uh, we had a fabulous time, and, and and Karen and I have been friends ever since. We stay in touch uh, very frequently. We, you know, found out we had quite a bit in common, and she's just a great lady. And you know, so every now and then, it's 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 uh, it's pretty cool. You actually get to have a chance to sit down and talk to some of these people about what went into their creative process. So. Yeah, I was trying to place where I recognize your name from, Jimmy and Paul, and 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 Padre were talking about the Daniel Suarez books. That's where they were. We're most familiar with with you from, and it's it must be those Star Wars books. That's probably what I'm thinking. That I'm, because I know I've done. It's such a huge, it's such a huge universe. It's hard to know where to dip in. Oh but, yeah, uh, the but I've Star seen, Wars EU is huge. Yeah, yeah. It's good. There's a lot of books to, to be enough. Read. That's where yeah, exactly, exactly. So so now the the interaction with the authors is that usually. Uh, is it uh, do you s just chance meetings or are they just wanted to meet you before the audiobook or do they actually work with you uh, as far as the your delivery of the book? Well, no. I, in my experience, it, it's you know rare that uh, you would ever get a chance to talk to them beforehand. Um, usually, it'll go through the producer or the director if there's a director working on the book. Um, you know, and any questions you have about pronunciation, et cetera, um, will be fielded through the producer and then come back to you. So you don't necessarily, or at least in my experience, uh, you don't get a chance to really uh, sit down and chat with them ahead of time, which would be great. But, uh, um, you know, maybe in a way it's 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 almost more useful because then you can um, just sort of treat it the way you would a, a, a play that doesn't have a living playwright. So... You know, you get to actually just read it, interpret it your way, and then, and then do it. But, um, no, the only occasions where I've uh, gotten to meet or speak with any of the other authors was uh, post-recording. So. Uh, Jeff, if you could, could you take us through what a typical process would be? So let's say, okay, you, you've landed a contract to do the audiobook of X. And um, what goes into it? I mean, your, your first reading... Uh, you're in the sound booth. You're in post editing. What what do you have to do to make sure that your vision for the character get gets carried through? Well, uh, you know, largely it's it's just about um, the first read and and preparing there. Um, you know, with with something like Demon, uh, you know, or or any of the sort of uh, cyber thrillers or military novels I've done, uh, uh, there's always going to be a ton of preparation in terms of uh, terminology that I that I'm not familiar with. Uh, so uh, for me, I'll, I'll read through the book, and um, lots of folks do it different ways. I like to just sit there with a good old paper and pen, 
and just write down the name of the character and then um, my observations. And then, you know, as you read through a book, you, you more things are revealed about each character. And so I'll take notes there. And then um, generally what I like to do is, is um, record myself a little uh, sample of the, the voice I'm going to try to use ah, you know, yes. right to my iPhone or something so that I've got it handy in the booth, um, you know, as we go. So I've got my my handy notes and I've got my recordings and then we get in the booth and we just start reading and uh, and uh, go from there. Do those Is sorts this... of do those sorts of accent <clears throat> choices or, or voice cho choices that you're gonna that you're gonna use do those get run by the producer the director or is that uh, I mean how, how, how independent are you how, what collaboration is there on that? Well no I mean they they Generally, I, I haven't run those things by uh, uh, anyone ahead of time, but as we're reading, you know, again, for instance, with military novels, um, you're talking about, you know, books that will have a, 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 a large portion of the characters are, are men, ages 20 to, say, 60, and, you know, eventually you're, you're uh, you know, running out of voices to use to keep them different. But, um, you know, and that's where an accent will come in handy. And sometimes with the director, or if there's no director on it with uh, 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 whomever's engineering slash directing, um, you know, you can try different things out and sort of come to a consensus. But largely it's it's left in the hands of the narrator. Um, sometimes the book gives you a clue and may, or, you know, makes it uh, right. Completely clear where the person's from, and you know what the what the. He's got an obviously be, Russian last name or something. You might just right, right. naturally, yeah, okay. But other than that, it it just gets left in your hands, and sometimes you know uh, I'll make an executive decision to give someone an accent just because um, you know we need that that variation so that you can differentiate between uh, different characters. So uh, it's great. I mean, doing audiobooks, I mean. From what I gather, and like I said, I've only really been at them um, regularly now for about six, seven years, I guess. Um, I guess the landscape has changed a great deal in that it used to be you did a book, there was a director there in the room who had also done you know, his or her share of research and um, had notes handy and, and all of that. But nowadays, um, it's, it's uh, oftentimes become just the reader uh, and the engineer. Um, in a way, you know, there's something nice about that because I, I suppose you, you get a chance to, um, you know, make all your own executive decisions and then realize them. But uh, for me personally, I, uh, it's going to sound a little maudlin, but I prefer the collaboration. I, I find it to be a much more creative endeavor um, uh, if I've got a director in there and, and uh, you know, you can, you can use each other to come up with, uh, with a way to do it better. And, and frankly, I think, uh, you know, you're always gonna do better when you've got a, an extra set of ears uh, you know, is, making sure do you think that's a case of just the explosion of audio books like sort of so many books turn into audio or because they're sold really as the regular book comes out is that do you think or or what you know, what's changed in the landscape I, you know I'm not sure but I, I, I think because um, I think largely it's it's what you suggested first it's that there's such a massive back catalog of material that's that's being recorded now that um, you know there's just not directors to go around and you know, there's budgetary concerns and things like that and I I think the industry has probably found that you know uh, um, it it can be done without a director and uh, you know while I don't necessarily agree with that um, <laughs> as long as they haven't figured out how to replace the narrator then I'm I'm, I'm okay <laughs> with it. <laughs> well, I think Siri and Winston are, are uh, a long way from uh, being able to take over from Jeff Kerner at this point. <laughs> Again, they've, uh, yeah. they've, they've been able to, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, uh, eliminate the actor in terms of uh, the on-camera. So yes. uh, what is the term? And I've done this before, too, and I can't think of it, but uh, mocap. You know, they okay. can just mocap everything and eventually... Uh, you know, maybe they'll actually <laughs> figure do, it do out. Do you think we're, we're really well. going there? With uh, I know you've done some video game work. We'll talk a little bit about that. But do you think we're we're moving towards that, where uh, the acting will be done uh, in, in a three D processor, and and uh, not the acting, the, but the actual movement, the the character, the, the human being won't be real, but the acting will be done by a guy like Jeff Gurner wearing a motion capture suit. Uh, it's, it's I mean, it's already happening, you know, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it's certainly trending toward that. I mean, uh, I don't think that's going to happen when you're, you know, doing, ah, there's the kitty cat. 
Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, you know, when you're doing uh, you know, your your Merchant Ivory film. But uh, for all the special effects stuff, yeah, absolutely, it's uh, it's become a pretty go-to process. I, I don't think it's ever going to, you know, take over. But uh, well, I know Hobbit was uh, made completely in this small room. Like eighty percent of the movie was done in a in a small green room. So sure, yeah, and not, I, not I, like it, a green room be, with you know chips and nachos and stuff. Like an actual <laughs> room go. painted green. Reach over and grab your craft services That's you know, right. while you're actually acting. <laughs> Video games. Jeff, are are you able to get? Uh, how long does it take you to do, say, like a fourteen-hour audiobook? Um, you know, uh, generally, I, I find myself working three to four days to get uh, between, uh, you know, ten and fourteen finished hours, uh, maybe more. Anywhere, three to five days is what it takes for me. You're getting larger and larger. <laughs> um, is, is that it? Is, <laughs> <laughs> is is that in like two hour sessions at a time, or do you just no, sort of go until in the course of a day a until day. you can't go anymore? That's pretty much it. I mean, generally uh, you're scheduled for a full day, which is a, a seven hour day. Yeah. Um, I guess you can't go and, beyond that. You'd hurt your voice. You'd hurt your. Yeah, you get a little worn down for sure after a while. Um, but uh, yeah, generally they schedule schedule you for a, a full eight hour day, an hour for lunch, and. Uh, you know, in 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 three to four of those, I can I can bang out a, uh, uh, you know, a, a ten to fourteen hour finished hour uh, audiobook. Now, do you give them multiple takes, multiple you know views of a particular scene, or you you give them one and then you give them another if they ask for it? Yeah, no, it's it's not like doing film. It's it's not uh, let's get that one again. It's you read, you start from go, and you keep reading. If you make a mistake. Um, in, on some occasions, they, they'll do it where you can make the mistake and then just keep going, and then it's up to the people in post. You know, you've got the engineer making uh, notes about where you stopped and started and how many times you okay. restarted, et cetera. Uh, and in post, they take care of it. Uh, but lately, again, the trend has been, and, uh, you know, probably, again, due to budgetary concerns, is to do what they call the punch and roll, where you sit in there and you read, and, and if you make a mistake, they go back, you stop. They punch you in, they, they play back from where you were, and they punch you in, and you just keep going. That way, in post, it's basically a single finished thing. Um, they're just going to go through and do QC and, and uh, you know, take out any, you know, glaring breaths, et cetera. That's so what we don't it, do, it QC. Those two ways. That's what we don't do, QC. We do no QC. <laughs> we don't do punch and roll either. We do stop, drop, and roll. There well, if go. we did QC, <laughs> most of our episodes would be, like, two minutes long. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it would just be... Uh, uh, Jeff Smith's theme song and closing right. credits. That'd be about it. <laughs> I love the theme song. It's great. Jeff Smith, thejeffsmith.com. That's, that's no, where I, the book guy's theme song came from? Yeah, Jeff Smith out of uh, Nashville. He, uh, he put that together for us. Right on. Wonderful musician. Uh, Jeff, let me ask you something else. Um, so voice acting is it's a, it's, a, it's a rigorous discipline because you don't have your face. You don't have your emotions to convey feeling. It's, got, it's all got to be in your voice. And voice, the voice acting community tends to be pretty exclusive, right? I mean, you hear the same people over and over again because they're no, they're a known quantity. People know that they're going to get quality work out of them. People know that, you know, uh, the audience likes them. Uh, so it seems like voice acting is this super elite cadre of people who, uh, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to break into it. So how did you break into it? Well, you know, uh, it used to be that. Uh, I mean, Generally, though, I, I think the way most actors begin in 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 in, in voiceover acting uh, is the commercial route. Uh, you know, doing a television, radio commercials. Um, uh, it, it used to be that that was all. You know, back in the day of the the deep voiced, golden throated announcer, which it's just not anymore. Then it was a really small circle. There were voiceover actors who, you know, you know, that's what you got the guy for because he had that voice. But um, as with, with much of the industry, I mean, it, it's really now trended toward real people, real voices, uh, mm. regular sounding guys. I mean, I can tell you, you know, largely how I spend my days is auditioning for or recording commercials. And every piece of copy we see nowadays says conversational, not announcery. Um, you know, they, they want a very real vibe. And I think you'll even notice it, you know, certainly when you're, when you're watching television commercials, um, it's not even just the the VO. It's not just the announce that's coming in, you know, uh, over the spot. But but the actors that are being used in commercials. Again, way back in the day, it was 
soap opera good looking they call it um, you know that's who was in commercials now it's as real as they can get I mean even to the point where I, I read a really interesting article the other day I think it was in Variety um, you know where they're talking about uh, now instead of casting an actor to play a doctor in a commercial they're just going to get a doctor um, you know I think reality television has, has uh, perpetuated that a bit but um, the voice acting world ha has indeed opened up to a, a much wider variety of folks I think because um, you know, it's uh, everything now has sort of um, tended toward you know real as possible. So, um, well, it is a I, I guess a small circle in terms of getting started. Um, it's certainly become a much broader circle. So it's a little bit like podcasting. You don't have to be good looking. You don't have to have a good voice, but yet you can be a superstar. Just have something <laughs> fabulous to say. Well, we don't even have that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff, where would you put someone like, say, uh, Mike Rowe, who definitely has an announcer voice? He's got that deep-throated feel, but then he sort of broke into being in front of the camera yeah. uh, with, with reality programming, and now people know his face and they know his voice, and he continues to get commercial work. He continues to get uh, you know TV time. Sure. You know, Mike Rowe's got a great sounding voice. I mean, it's, it's, it's rich sounding and all of that. But again, I think the reason Mike Rowe is so popular now is as, uh, well, as a spokesman for Ford and all that. I mean, it, he's, he's a very handsome guy and all of that. Looks good on camera. And he, who wouldn't want him as their spokesman? But um, as a voiceover guy, you know, what he's really got in spades, and again, what we see on commercial copy every day in terms of the direction, and, and believe me, his name is on the copy all the time, looking for a Mike Rowe type um, you know, whoever's the uh, the actor du jour, but um, what he's got in spades is that he's he's got a great storyteller quality. Um, and again, in the old days of commercials, you wanted an announcer. Now they want guys who are storytellers, who are just able to read a piece of copy and, and infuse it with um, um, real sensibilities, you know, with, with real life. And, and Mike Rowe's great at that. So, uh, you know, um, while he started out as 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 uh, in television hosting and uh, uh, you know doing the dirty jobs uh, gig, he um, uh, you know has has parlayed that into a VO career too because because uh, he's good at it. Yeah. yeah, he annoys me. I liked him better when he was just behind the microphone <laughs> on Deadly well, Catch. <laughs> I saw See, Sir I Jimmy shaking his head there. So I'm like, oh. <laughs> he's, I'm, I'm telling you, Sir Jimmy. I'm telling you, Sir Jimmy. His name is on. Every other piece of copy that I read as a reference. So, he's a, now I didn't know historically. I I first heard of Mike Rowe on on the Dirty Jobs, but uh, are, are you saying that he actually started out as as uh, just doing narration? Well, yeah. Oh, have you ever seen yeah. Deadliest Catch? I haven't seen Deadliest Catch, but I, I thought that came after Dirty Jobs. He makes fishing fly. exciting. Uh, that was that was first. Yeah, it, Deadliest it, Catch it, has it, been it out five through, years. Yeah, if you look through the discussion there were a lot of their documentaries that had his voice. Okay. And, and people expected that voice. It was one of those things like, oh, it's that guy again. But it wasn't right. until Deadliest Catch and Dirty Jobs that people were like, oh, that's Mike Bro's voice. Mike Got it. Right. Yeah. Now, well, now, he's good at his job. What are some, him. Is there any difference between doing an audiobook? I mean, obviously, other than the, the length of time between doing an audiobook and doing uh, video game work, I see. I'm, I'm looking through your, your IMDb page. I mean, I think I've killed you in Alan Wake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you were in uh, with the Grand Theft Auto 4 expansion, The Ballad of Gay Tony. You were Maury Kibitz. Uh -huh. I was. That 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 was a uh, that was sort of part of the the, the new way they're doing. It, it used to be in video games. Um, you know, everything was animated in terms of the characters, and uh, the actors were just in front of a mic recording the uh, the okay. dialogue, but. Uh, Ballad of Gay Tony was my first experience doing mocap, and um, yeah, because that one—that was one of the later. That was the uh, the when they started doing the the mocap in the Grand Theft Auto series. I mean, that, there was some realistic looking uh, uh, yeah, mouth because, movements, and well, what they've done is that when they first started using actors' faces in mocap, they would have the little mocap dots all over your face, and um, you would you know sit in front of a camera and do the lines and, mm -hmm. and be as expressive as possible, and then they would transfer that into uh, you know the the computer world. But now, when we did Ballad of Gay Tony, they, uh, I guess, had just started working with these, um, you've got the mocap suit on, which, uh, you know, if people don't know, it's a skin-tight spandex suit with the reflective silver balls. All you look over like it. a superhero, kind of. Pretty much. <laughs> and um, you're in a, you know, a, 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 on a soundstage that has um, cameras set up across the perimeter of the ceiling. Uh, you know, maybe 30 cameras that are shooting you from every angle, and basically what they're doing is they're beaming light off of the uh, 
the reflective balls uh, and transferring it back into the computer so that it captures your motion. But what they had introduced when we did Ballad of Gay Tony was um, from the mocap helmet uh, came a, an apparatus that came out in front of you and held a camera directly in front of your face so that instead of doing the dots on your face, the camera shot exactly what you were doing as you acted out the scene with the other actors. Um, and that's why now when you look at video games, I mean, if you look at Ballad of Gay Tony, although they, uh, you know, they turned me into a, a steroid abusing, you know, beefy uh, 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 bodybuilder type, um, it's my face. So they, they, I, I so they now, uh, you know, they now will shoot the actual face and... Uh, it was a pretty cool experience doing that gig. I, I'm looking here. I'm going to put it on the screen for the podcast. So that's Maury Kibitz. That's you, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Love the gold it's chains. Hot. Yeah, they gave me hair, too. Which yeah, they gave you some hair. Neat. Oh, there <laughs> so might so be I've hope. got to ask, do they mocap the mustache as well? Because that's important to me as well. Right? <laughs> you got to make the mustache <laughs> work. Yeah, but I mean, that, that's, you know... Uh, Wow, that's that's closer to you know working in television than it is to audiobook narration at that point. Well, it is television like, or, or or film. I mean, it, when we did the you know when I did Max Payne, it was nothing but getting in front of the mic, reading all the lines, and uh, then you're out. Right. This was uh, me and uh, you know the two or three other actors uh, with whom I shared scenes actually getting up on the soundstage and and acting out the scene. I mean, uh, whatever gun battles we had to deal with, it was run, carry, you know, shoot jump all of those things and um uh, you know certainly you know much more rewarding in, in that respect and that you got to actually really interact with the other actors and create the scene as opposed to just talking in front of the mic it's amazing how far we've come because i mean uh, i'm looking again through your imdb here and even like grand theft auto san andreas as a you have to do some work as a pedestrian uh yeah. you probably just had to sit there and call me an idiot a couple times and <laughs> i'm sure you've called as me I, a, <laughs> as i recall on on uh, on san andreas um it was pedestrians and cops. I, I believe they had me doing uh, all of the uh, Mexican male pedestrians. So okay. uh, they brought me in to do my uh, my stock Mexican accent. So. <laughs> wow. So so how long did it take to to shoot all the uh, the footage for Ballad of Gay Tony? Let's say. Uh, I had you know all of my cut scenes and then uh, I think I had just two days in the studio. Might have been three uh, three days donning the mocap suit. Um, but you know the, the the guy who played the lead in that um, it's a Mario De Leon who played the, the main character. Um, weeks and weeks and weeks of shooting. It's no different than shooting a film. Oh. Um, as Maury Kibitz, uh, uh, Tim Adams, who played my brother, um, what's his character's name? I can't remember. One of the Kibitz brothers. Uh, he and I were, I think, there just for two or three days shooting. But uh, uh, Brucey, Brucey Kibitz. Brucey Kibitz, right? And he had done another title as as Brucey as well, but. Um, you know, uh, it, when, nowadays when you're doing a video game, it's no different than, than booking a film. I mean, you actually are on set and, uh, you know, working actually under, well, it's changing now with the merger of the unions, but uh, working under a SAG uh, contract. And the budgets and the box office are sometimes akin to Hollywood Absolutely. movies as well. Well, I, I would, I'm going to hazard a guess that uh, GTA V is probably uh, going to break the record of any movie that comes out this year. Oh, I think it's pre-sale will be ridiculous. I think didn't GTA Four did do something like a billion, one point something billion dollars. It blew yeah. away everything else. Wow. So I mean, uh, we're almost at the point where you know, being the the title actor in Grand Theft Auto uh, is more important than being in the you know Academy Award winning film, a feature film. Yeah. yeah. Which is why you know you're also seeing a, t a trend of uh, you know celebrities really starting to uh, act in video games as well. So. Well, there's, uh, more, there's more money more, in video yeah. games. There's way more money in video games than there are in movies right now. Well, there's it's way more money industry. in video games if you're a celebrity. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. you're still, you know, as 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 a blue collar actor, you know, you're still just being paid a day rate and all of that. As celebrities can command a different uh, uh, a different fee, but um, you are right in saying that uh, you know the work is plentiful because um, you know video games have now become. Uh, you know, I think just as important a component of, uh, of media entertainment. So. Now, Jeff, where, where can people uh, find out more about you? Is there a website? Is there a Twitter handle we can uh, give out? I do. Uh, I have a website. It's just uh, jeffgerner.com, and it's uh, Gerner like uh, Turner with a G, so G-U-R-N-E-R. -E and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it stays updated with, uh, with uh, all my goings on. And... Uh, 
uh, Twitter, uh, yeah, you can get me at uh, Jeff Gurner. Uh, House of Gurn is my Twitter handle. But, and uh, what, what are you working on now? What's your next project, if you're allowed to tell us? Uh, yeah, right now, you know what, I'm actually in between audiobooks. I know that there's um, some more of uh, the Robin Monarch series coming up. Uh, it'll probably be, likely be the next one that I work on. Um, it is going to make me crazy. The writer of the Robin Monarch series was um, uh, Mark Sullivan. And uh, Mark Sullivan, um, he was a researcher and writer for Tom Clancy. And um, uh, this uh, this Robin Monarch series is is his foray into the uh, into the world, uh, you know, his own stuff. And uh, it's it's pretty great. He's a really interesting character, this Robin Monarch. And uh, uh, you know, I know we have some more of those coming up. So so uh, I think that'll be about the next uh, audiobook title. But um, I get surprised, you know. Uh, I could get a call tomorrow saying, hey, here's a book. I also want to ask you, what's your favorite accent? And can you answer in that accent? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do an Australian. Yeah, it's one of my favorite. I like to do the uh, the Aussies. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm good with the Brits. I'm good with them. You know, I, accents and dialects have sort of uh, always come naturally to me. And um, uh, I love doing them. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, it was funny. I had to do in... Um, might have been in, in one of the Robin Monarch books, um, uh, South African, which is an incredibly difficult accent to That's do. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, or uh, there were a, a, a state of different Middle Eastern characters in it as well. And um, there's a couple great websites that I go to as, as, as tools um, to study up, you know, before I, uh, before I actually get in the booth. But, um, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, you you want to be as accurate as possible. You know, if you're doing a Syrian character versus an Iraqi character or, uh, or whatnot. But um, yeah, the uh, the uh, gumming through the South African one took a lot of prep time. That was a, that was a rough one. I can imagine. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, thank you so much for what you do, because uh, I'm sure it would cost me a fortune to actually hire you to walk around all day behind me reading a novel. So I'm glad that audiobooks <laughs> exist. <laughs> This is I'm never up in Canada. I'll just, uh, just <laughs> but, you hang know, out. I'll, I'll just read to you. I know that the, you know thousands and thousands and perhaps millions of books uh, that your your uh, you know people have listened to you narrate. And uh, uh, like I said, folks, go to audible.com and search for Jeff Gurner. You'll find all the books he's done. Uh, go back through our podcast. We've talked about a lot of them. Uh, not only is it a great narration, but uh, you've been lucky to get some really great books to work with. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll stick around, Je uh, Jeff. We're going to do uh, book news right after the break. We'll talk a little Certainly. bit more with you, and uh, we'll go through some book news, and maybe you could uh, put that uh, the South African accent on for us later. Uh, absolutely <laughs> not. Only with preparation. No <laughs> we'll be right back after the break, folks. Hi, this is Colin Ferguson. I play Sheriff Jack Carter on Eureka, and you're listening to The Book Guys. And we are back with Book News. Now, gentlemen, last week we were talking about Space Marines. Um, Professor Allen, I believe you've got some news for us on that. Happened uh, after we broadcast. I am not. I'm not looking at the link right now. But they did. They did settle it, or or at least I think it was a. It was a, the claim was thrown out, and the claim was that. Uh, publishing the with the book title Space Marine the issue was whether that um, you know, violated the copyright of the game right you know using Space Marine in the game and the, the the article said well you know this term has been around 70 or 80 years so no you can't you can't, can't exercise it. the claim and the book yeah. I guess had been removed from Amazon temporarily and and then now is back and up for sale. And we did mention that, uh, you know, the United States going, uh, the Marine Corps going into space might have had an issue with uh, Games Workshop because of that trademark. But you know what? Them too. Uh, Naval Space Command was active from 1983 to 2002. So they already had a, like a Marine Space Command. Uh, it's now been wrapped in, in 2002, it was wrapped into NSOC, which is the Naval Network and Space Operations Command. So there you go. <laughs> The Hubble probably has some machine guns on or something. Just saying. Womp womp. <laughs> that uh, Hubble space scope. Uh, that's right. Hubble telescope. It's really a super drone. 
<laughs> it's actually the, the Hubble Space Sniper Rifle. It's amazing. <laughs> Have you ever seen the movie Real Genius? It's just going to... That's right. <laughs> <laughs> And we also have uh, that's actually the, that's the movie that got me into engineering. It made me want to do science. I wanted to create a giant laser. <laughs> nice <Awesome movie. laughs> crocodiles with lasers. Uh, film news. We, we have a jingle for that as, as well. Here, let's do this. Books on film and television. Just two days ago, Deadline reported that filmmaker Shane Salerno has completed Salinger. He's been working on this movie for eight years, uh, but when uh, the Salinger passed away. Uh, uh, he had some more information. He got some more interviews, so he decided not to release the movie. Apparently, it's been improved. Uh, it's going to be... He finished in 2009. He was finished, done. Uh, but he, he put the project on uh, hiatus after his death in 2010. At the age of 91, life well lived, J.D. Salinger. And uh, there's a lot of people who he had already interviewed who kind of kept quiet because the guy was still alive. Now they're like... He dead. I'm talking. <laughs> so it looks like the the movie based on uh, the well, not based on, but the movie movie about the life of J.D. Salinger. Uh, we're going to be seeing it in t- January of 2014. It's going to be airing on PBS. PBS is American Masters, and the title is Salinger. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, this was uh, going to be tied in with a Simon and Schuster biography, uh, co-written by Salerno, and that'll be in shelves uh, September of this year. I'm looking forward to it. Why not? When a rumor meets a rumor coming through the rye. And the estate, uh, J.D. Salinger did say that uh, he didn't want to see a movie made from Catcher in the Rye, so he's always against it. But he d- said he did leave uh, the rights to the movie, to the book, to his family as a insurance policy after his death. And he did give them his uh, blessings to say here, you know, if you're ever in tough times, he goes, I prefer you never make a movie out of this, but if you need a couple million dollars, yeah, go for it. So we, you know what? Cha-ching, I think we'll see a J catcher in the rise soon. So, so when he said there'd be a movie made over his dead body? Literally, is yes. Is that what he meant? <laughs> yes, and, and actually they've already signed the, an actor to play the titular character. It's uh, going to be Justin Bieber. Yes. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Bieber as Holden Caulfield. And oh, my Lord. <laughs> that, that would be fun. <laughs> no, never, please. Uh, staying on books on film and television for now, Doctor Who. It's now confirmed. We're not. We're no longer talking out our backsides. Uh, BBC bosses have said that the 50th anniversary will be a 3D celebration. Will feature all the Doctors. Will be uh, released in theaters, 3D IMAX. So I'm lo- really looking forward to this now in November. This could be interesting, and uh, a lot of the Doctors have signed on. Uh, just because they're all going to be there doesn't mean that the original actor is going to be there. But uh, I'm not sure how they're going to work some of the older actors because they no longer resemble their previous selves. Uh, but it's looking like it's going to be a, s- a scenario probably like when Mr. Gurner went through for the Grand Theft Auto uh, Ballad of Gay Tony, I think. <laughs> I think what we're going to see is a, a, a CGI recre- recreation of these characters. But the original actors will still be able to act. I think the BBC is putting a lot of money into this. And uh, when they say theatrical release, we don't know if it's going to be like you know, two theaters in Wales, or if it's this is going to be a Hollywood production, but it's coming in November. I mean, they're either going to surprise the world with this, or... Now, they don't have to worry about the appearance of the older Doctors, because if you remember from the special, the Time Crash special with David Tennant, and the, uh, who was, which Doctor, the fifth Doctor? Uh, no, it, it, uh, yes, Peter it was Peter Davison, yes. Thank you, thank you. They explained why he looked differently because with the presence of both doctors in the same timeline, it shorts out the age differential. Ah, uh, sci-fi can explain away anything. I love it. <laughs> and the uh, and the the former doctors who have passed away. How are we going to explain that? Oh, we're, they're going to recast. Uh, now, they're, they're doing a, a this is another special. This with, is where Father Robert comes in to explain it. That's. No, mocap. It's all mocap. mocap. <laughs> no, but they're, they are doing a special uh, show about the creation of the of Doctor Who, and there already is an actor who is uh, slated to play the first Doctor and another actor to play the second daughter, uh, Doctor. And the second do- Doctor actor is related. I'm not sure if he's a son of the second Doctor or uh, he's related somehow He's in the family. Uh, yeah, could be interesting. Yeah, we'll see. I'm, Doctor Who, 3D, IMAX, yeah. can't go wrong. I'm... I would guess I they would do some sort of, you know, midnight screening. I mean, maybe even like it's just a one-day release sort of mega, 
Line, there would be lines around the block. I mean, they, you, you would have to cancel college classes. I think <laughs> all around the if, universe, all around the country, for that. You think Almost so? Really? As if we had heard cloister bells. Oh, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> but do you really think it's going to be that popular in the United States? I mean, uh, this is not. You know, we're not in England. I mean, even in Canada. I mean, uh, Doctor Who fans are considered like the nerds of nerds. We're, we're looked <laughs> down upon by Star Trek nerds. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where being a being a, a big fan myself, I'm, I don't care. I really don't <laughs> care. It's like, look, I love the series. It's 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 rich. It's imaginative. It's fun. Look down at me. It's here's, like I'm used to. Please. Here's my story. In class on Tuesday, a student in a class of fifteen. I did have one girl wearing a bow ties or cool T-shirt, so Very that nice. is all of the uh, scientific uh, evidence I need. Bow ties are cool, much cooler than fezes. Bow ties, are and, cool. you know what and, else is cool? Well, fez is pretty good. Too. I think we we pretty much are across the board here. I'm not I'm not sure about Jeff, but we all think AMC's Walking Dead is pretty cool. Now, uh, Walking Dead's awesome. Going forward on their record smashing success, of course, of The Walking Dead, AMC is looking to develop another monster chasing human uh, series. Uh, they're doing an adaptation of Dan Simmons' 2000 novel about a Royal Naval crew who find themselves stranded and starving in the Arctic only to encounter a mythological beast who pops up to kill them whenever things aren't already shitty enough. That's right off the AMC. <laughs> 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 so uh, it's uh, s developing, it's called The Terror. The name of the, of the show is going to be called The Terror. And, um, wow, and they're also adapting, screenwriter who, for that is David Kajanich, and he's currently also adapting Stephen King's The Stand. Wow, interesting. <laughs> ben Affleck may be producing that one. <laughs> who knows? And that's our books. He did pretty good at Ar with Argo. He did, he did. Why, yep. why is LeVar Burton singing Reed and Rainbow uh, loaded on my iPad? I think Kevin. Lo why? Why would it not be loaded on your hey, iPad? That would be. Hello. Like I think someone's playing oh, a guys. prank on me. They saw my news stories all set up, and no, uh, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> uh, last little bit of book news here. Uh, we missed this one. Uh, at least I did. I. It was Publishers Weekly announced that Amazon is poised to sell used eBooks. Padre, I think we talked about this. Professor Allen, Sir Jimmy, wow. the, this would be the coolest thing ever. Um, that's so, actually huge. That's that's actually progress. You see, it's progress. If, it, I still can't. If they're, if they're counting them as property. Yes, because now I, I can't. I still can't give them to Jeff Gerner, but I can sell them back to Amazon for you know they'll probably give me a stipend, little <laughs> nothing, but uh, then they will sell it on my behalf to someone else, and I'll get a little bit of money out of it. I'm sure they're not gonna you know if it's a 99 cent ebook, I'm gonna get 20 cents back, but it is progress. Like you said, Professor. Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's huge because that that means there's at least one entity out there that's accepting electronic first right of sale, which means you actually own something. Versus the the model that we have right now, if you actually look at the fine print for anything you buy from Amazon or uh, iTunes, you can't pass it on. It's, if you die, you can't pass on your book collection or your iTunes collection to somebody else. I mean, you you could physically give someone the device, but they don't legally own it. If I can sell what I have to somebody else, it means I actually do own something. That's right. So, uh, good good news. So, this comes about because Boston-based Redigi, which is a company that opened uh, in the market of music, uh, they launched in late 2011, and what they do is you give them your music, they do whatever they do with it and resell it for you, and uh, they won a lawsuit against Capitol Records filed in the U.S. District Court in Manhattan, and uh, now with that win in court behind them, they've decided, screw it, we're doing ebooks. So uh, yeah, it's a step forward for uh, these ebooks and audiobooks I downloaded being transferable, which we've always said that's what we want. Yeah, le le legal precedent that they're property, not just a license. That's, that's correct. That's huge, huge. And while we're here, Jeff, we might as well do some technology because I know the Padre, the Padre, his collar is twitching. And he wants to talk some tech. <laughs> technology. See, we listen to the listeners. The technology jingle, I've, I've lowered the volume. <laughs> yeah. 
So just I before need to we started, way to get that on my iPhone now. I, I know. I, I know. You, you know what? Ringtone. Well, you know, this is on topic here. You know what, Sir Jimmy? It took me. It was a nightmare to get. First of all, to get my IRS tax number to be able to sell books on iTunes. I am up to five iTunes accounts. Now I can sell books on iTunes. So I figured, okay, I've got a producer account. I've, I'm connected through iTunes Connect. I've filled out paperwork. I've linked my bank account. I've sent them a vial of my blood. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put up some of our jingles as, as ringtones. What the hell? You know, now. Oh, no, 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 no. They said, no, you have to start another iTunes account and start the process all over again. I was like, no, damn you, Apple. But uh, yeah, it's weird. You should be able to, if you're a developer, you should be a developer. You know, that's it. Here, you can sell stuff on iTunes. Go for it. But, you know, I don't know. It's too much hassle for me to, another email address. Bah. I'm just going to put them so on the website. I'm going to put them on the website and just let everyone have at it. <laughs> Enjoy. Oh, I mean, I've got them. I've got them. But how do I get it on my iPhone as a ringtone? Oh, okay. Uh, Windows, you would. Ah, oh, that is a good question. I think in, in Windows. No, is there no way to do it in Windows, Padre? Well, if I have an Android phone, I just plug it in and transfer it over like a USB drive. You know, that's that's one of the. But I know it's app. It's Apple, so it means there, you there's have, a way to do it. There's you have a to way. stick it through the <laughs> iTunes software, which is, but it doesn't treat it quite as media. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a tutorial on that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> we'll look it up and we'll get back to you, Sir Jimmy. <laughs> I'm right. Hey, okay. I'm writing that Help down. Me. Ringtones. <laughs> what other technology news? Uh, just before we start today, actually, an hour before we uh, started recording, uh, someone was on stage somewhere, I think in New York, in a stadium, talking about uh, a PlayStation 4. Right. So we had the uh, the big Sony press event, which uh, people had been hinted to. Uh, it was no no secret that they were going to announce the PS4, the PlayStation 4, uh, although they had, they had never confirmed that. And the very first thing that they bring out, of course, is the PlayStation 4. Now, uh, in the early video, it looks impressive. I mean, the hardware is impressive. They're moving well away from cell architecture, which is that super computing chipset that they had created in conjunction with a couple of other manufacturers, to x86, which is what your PC would run. So right. they're kind of going the Xbox route. Oh, we're going to uh, hack the, the crap out of that, eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it makes it cheaper for them, and it also opens up the, the console to, to other types of software. Uh, a couple of big announcements that they they have attached to this is that it's got a streaming service. It's I can't I can never pronounce it right. It's like Gaiki, which allows for playing games over the internet. Okay. Uh, which which is which is very important because it does not have any legacy support. So if you have a PS3 or a PS uh, or a PlayStation, it will not play those so titles. This is similar on to the OnLive, the OnLive service right. where it's it's like, it right. streams exactly. your game. Yeah. And, and and that's actually a really good uh, a good use of the streaming service because people always complain. Wait a minute, I've, I have a PS3. Shouldn't my PS3 games work on my PS4? Now they can say, well, if you have a PS3, you register those games with your account, and now you can stream them for free. I don't know if they'll do that, okay. but they actually have the ability. Do you own the uh, games uh, though? Can you transfer like, them to someone else? Probably not, right? Is it like a, <laughs> yeah. like iTunes Match? Uh, well, it could be. I mean, but I mean, it's more like. Um, if your PS3 is registered under your name, okay. those games belong to you. That, okay. that, that's basically, I, I mean, they, they could do it many different ways, but the technology is there for them to allow it. I, I like the uh, convenience of OnLive. I like that I can log in uh, here. It's like a three megabyte or four megabyte or 20 megabyte download, and I have access to all my games because I lose CDs all the time, DVDs. You know, it's, it's right. great that I can log in, I can play Grand Theft Auto and beat the crap out of Jeff Gurner. Right. <laughs> Again, well, I mean, and again, and again. And again. <laughs> they've also they've also um, made an interesting announcement for anyone who's who's thinking about doing any of their own creative development, and that is, they really are reaching out to the independent, to the indie game maker. Um, in fact, they had who did they have? They had Jonathan Blow, who is known for making a game called Braid, which is oh, you yes. know it, it was a very simple game that just everyone loved, fell in love. The gameplay, the graphics, they were all really really good. And so they're, they're making it possible for these indie game makers to get on the console a lot easier. Uh, so, yeah, some, some interesting news. It looks like it's, it's definitely going to be a step forward in the hardware. It looks like they're looking at streaming games. It looks like they've acknowledged that the console is not just for gaming, but it's, it's the number one way that people get Netflix onto their TV. Uh, so 
Yeah, not not a bad press conference. And I know the it's, PS3 it's had all, all that computing power in it. I mean, it was kind of overkill. Uh, oh. One of the United States uh, supercomputers was created out of 1,700 PS3s networked. So that's actually one of their like supercomputers is just a room full of PlayStations. That's, it's still it, which the was best Blu-ray player. Oh, yeah. It's, it was a great supercomputer. It was just really, really difficult to program games for it. <laughs> That's why they're sort of stuck. Well, let's, let's take a, a thing in the room here. Raise your hands if you watch Blu rays regularly. Never seen one. Wow. I wow. Love it. There you go. You know, the digital age. I, I Netflix HD. Netflix. It's good enough. You know, I'm not paying $80 to watch a Blu ray. <laughs> well, it's, it's not even just, just good enough. It's, look, at this point, convenience matters more yeah. than super, super high quality. Yes. And if, it, if you make it convenient for me, you know what? I'll take a slight downgrade in quality if it means I can watch it on every, any device I want, anytime I want. Yeah. There um, is one other piece of technology oh, news. There's more, but wait. There's there more. Is, there is one more, and that is today uh, the long-awaited announcement from Google about Project Glass. So last year at uh, Google I.O., that was last uh, June, uh, they made this big hoopla over these brand new glasses that you could buy that would do something. We weren't really sure what, but uh, it would do something. Well, they just announced to the, the early developers, the people who signed up to buy these $1,500 glasses, uh, and they showed a video of, of the actual glasses at work. They're, it's, it's actually quite interesting. Now, it does mean that anybody who registered to get one of these sets of glasses like, for example, yours truly, Ooh. anyone who has one of these little glass things with the, uh, the numbers, I have number 118, uh, we're going to be getting our uh, developer kits pretty dang soon. And we can start doing things like live streaming what we're seeing. It will do things like facial recognition, so you can actually walk up to somebody, it will recognize their face, and then give you, say, their Google Plus account uh, information. It's, uh, it's an interesting concept. Uh, we'll, we'll see if it's anything even close to what Paul is currently wearing on his face. <laughs> Will it have green flashing lights and shamrocks and four-leaf clovers? You know, I, th I think that comes in revision, too. <laughs> so that's exciting. So you'll be getting your uh, Google Glasses soon? That's, uh, I do have to I'm come up with for Google dollars. Google yeah. <laughs> How much? Sorry? 1,500 smackers. Okay, now is that because uh, you're paying also for the developer kit, or is that the actual price point on these things at this point? That's the well. I mean, for the regular people, it'll probably be about a thousand. It's a computer. It's a full blown computer. So yeah, yeah. Um, you know, now, now, me and sunglasses. I've learned. I learned a long time ago never to spend more than twenty dollars on sunglasses because I pay a hundred, eighty. I lose them. I sit on them. Now, uh, now it's gonna be the thousand dollar glasses. Oh, I don't know, he, Padre. Between you, me, and the internet. <clears throat> the only reason why I'm doing this is because I was able to register for two kits, and I already have someone who is willing to pay three thousand dollars for his set, so mine will be free. <laughs> nice, nice. I'm just, I'm just, I, I, I'm just looking to get a side job at a local lost and found somewhere. I think that's really where the money's going to be made. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been able to hold on to a pair of glasses. Let's see if that changes. <laughs> Raise your hands if you're going to pay a thousand dollars for Google glasses. Padre, you're, you're, you're out of this one. Because <laughs> you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Blu-rays, Google Glasses, I don't know, not starting. Uh, if they keep the price point under, I mean, even at 100 bucks, I wouldn't get it. I'd lose it. I've already got a phone in my pocket. That's okay. I don't That's need more a phone here. Geeks. Uh, not, not all of us have the same lucrative jobs that Father... Ra hey, wait a minute. <laughs> 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 I had to borrow money to buy my soda tonight. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, we also, of course, Padre, the Audible app, reminding everyone, uh, if you already have the Audible app, go. it's free. Download it. Uh, download the update. Uh, your iPad app will now become a full screen. Lots of new features. There's a me feature that's got all, the, all your stats. I don't know if it syncs. I haven't checked yet if it syncs with your iPhone. As far as your... It's kind of... For me, it's disconcerting looking at how much time I've spent... You know, listening to Jeff Gurner, it's just, I look at it and I go, I got to stop reading so many books. See, I, I wouldn't Time know because th 
the, the application the on the Android uh, devices has been really, really good for such a long time. So again, I, 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 I can't, <laughs> I can't feel for you. And that's technology. I have one more. Uh, apparently, this is from yesterday. According to NPD, Apple accounted for one fifth of all consumer tech revenue last year. Good lord, that's a nineteen point nine percent. Second place, Samsung with nine point three. HP in third with 8.2, Sony with 4.4, and rounding up the top five, Dell with 3.0. Of course, Michael Dell. Wah, uh, wah. Michael Dell looking to buy back that company. Michael, retire. Not, <laughs> not sure why. It's a tax dodge. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> <Y'all> companies. <laughs> he probably got it cheap. <laughs> uh, if we have some time, I'm going to talk about one quick book on Audible. Uh, I don't know if any of you have uh, listened to this one. Are any of you Star Trek fans at all? Anybody watch? Jeff? Jeff's got his hand up. I admit it. <laughs> okay. I, I like to call Galaxy Quest one of my favorite Star Trek movies of all time. Absolutely. S- some Star Trek fans don't agree, but I think regardless of whether or not, you know, I know that uh, Shatner, you know, our good friend, oh my. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> We know everybody just didn't want to do it, but it came out as probably one of the best, funniest Star Trek movies of all time, even though it had uh, nothing to do with Paramount. Uh, this is, I'm going to say it right now, this is probably one of the best Star Trek audiobooks I've ever listened to, and it almost has nothing, uh, it's not by Paramount, it's not official Star Trek, it is funny at times, uh, it does have a Star Trek connection, it is read by our good friend Will Wheaton, and... Uh, it's called Red Shirts by John Scalzi. This is about a bunch of ensigns uh, aboard of some kind of spaceship, a part of the uh, Universal Union. You know, everything in Star Trek has a parallel in this. And they realize that, hey, there's these five guys, the captain and the, the doctor and all these guys. There's five guys on the ship that can never die. They never die. But anyone who gets assigned to go on away missions with these people is pretty much going to die. So all of these low-ranking people on this ship start figuring this out, and they start learning how to hide from everyone, <laughs> you know. So the captain will be looking around, you know, to put together an away team, and everyone's like, oh, just turns around the corridor and goes down another site because they know. They know they're going to die if they get onto the planet's surface. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of fun. I don't want to spoil any of it because there's a lot of twists and turns. It starts really campy. It starts very Galaxy Quest-ish, and then it gets a little mind warp warpy you know uh, they start doing time travel and uh all i'm just gonna all i'm gonna say is parallel and alternate universes uh if you're a fan of uh, star trek definitely uh you're gonna get a couple laughs out of this uh, if you're not a star trek fan don't bother like if you don't know what star trek is just fast forward to the end of the podcast we're done uh this is by john scalzi red shirts uh narrated by will Wheaton. i've gonna, I gotta play a little clip here uh this is from early on in the novel i did uh, pre-read uh, this one here we go From the top of the large boulder he sat on, Ensign Tom Davis looked across the expanse of the cave toward Captain Lucius Abernathy, Science Officer King, and Chief Engineer Paul West perched on a second, larger boulder and thought, well, this sucks. Borgovian landworms, Captain Abernathy said and smacked his boulder with an open palm. I should have known. You should have known? How the hell could you not have known, thought Ensign Davis, and looked at the vast dirt floor of the cave, its powdery surface moving here and there with the shadowy humps that marked the movement of the massive carnivorous worms. I don't think we should just be waltzing in there, Davis had said to Chen, the other crew member on the away team, upon encountering the cave. Abernathy, King, and West had already entered, despite the fact that Davis and Chen were technically their security detail. Chen, who was new, snorted. Oh, come on, he said. It's just a cave. What could possibly be in there? Bears, Davis had suggested. Wolves? Any number of large predators who see a cave as shelter from the elements? Have you never been camping? There are no bears on this planet, Chen had said, willfully missing Davis's point. And anyway, we have pulse guns. Now, come on. This is my first away mission. I don't want the captain wondering where I am. He ran in after the officers. From his boulder, Davis looked down at the dusty smear on the cave floor that was all that remained of Chen. 
the landworms, called by the sound of the humans walking in the cave, had tunneled up under him and dragged him down, leaving nothing but echoing screams and the smear. Well, that's not quite true, Davis thought, peering farther into the cave and seeing the hand that lay there, still clutching the pulse gun Chen had carried, and which, as it turned out, had done him absolutely no good whatsoever. The ground stirred and the hand suddenly disappeared. Okay, now it's true, Davis thought. Davis, Captain Abernathy called. Stay where you are. Any movement across that ground will call to the worms. You'll be eaten instantly. Thanks for the useless and obvious update, you jackass, Davis thought, but did not say because he was an ensign and Abernathy was the captain. Instead, what he said was, I, Captain. Good, Abernathy said. I don't want you trying to make a break for it and getting caught by those worms. Your father would never forgive me. What? Davis thought, and suddenly he remembered that Captain Abernathy had served under his father on the Benjamin Franklin, the ill-fated Benjamin Franklin. And, in fact, Davis's father had saved the then-ensign Abernathy by tossing his unconscious body into the escape pod before diving in himself and launching the pod just as the Franklin blew up spectacularly around them. They had drifted in space for three days and had almost run out of breathable air in that pod before they were rescued. And we're back. <laughs> I've got to say, Jeff, I enjoyed... As much as listening to Will Wheaton, I enjoyed watching you on the video here, listening intently to Will Wheaton. What are your thoughts? <laughs> and, uh, fabulous. I'm just still trying to, to deal with the picture in my head of, uh, what did it say? Blood-curdling screams and a smear. <laughs> and if you read the book, you learn about ice sharks. <laughs> I love it. There's a lot of ways a red shirt can die. I was actually, last week I was wearing my uh, Star Trek red shirt. Um, but yeah, that's the, it goes back to Star Trek where, you know, the original Star Trek where anyone wearing a red shirt that wasn't, you know, part of the narrative died. They liked killing a lot of people every episode. You know, right. in real life, that captain would have had his bars taken away, ship taken away from him. Like, dude, come on. Every week, three of your crew members die. You're, you're not a very good captain there, Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, what's uh, Sam uh, in Galaxy Quest? Sam, um, what's the actor's name who plays Guy? Oh, he yes, knows, yes. He knows he's doing right. He understands. He understands the, the scenario, yeah. So so much like if you enjoyed Galaxy Quest, if you're a Star Trek fan, you're going to like Red Shirts. Uh, it's, I can tell you it's a mind trip near the end. It starts off very campy, but uh, if you're a Star Trek fan, you'll understand uh, where they're going with this. And, uh, and Padre, next time you're talking to Felicia Day, put a bug in her ear and see if we can get Will on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get Felicia. Are you kidding me? Hey, get them both on the show. We have lots of room. Their, sch their schedules are crazy. I mean, they, they, they're always so nice about it. Like, oh, sure, totally. Well, come on. Uh, what days do you have? And you start listening to the days and they're like, oh, I'm in China. I'm in Russia. I'm in London. Right. I'm like, oh, well, never mind. Yeah, apparently running, schedule. running a successful video podcast network takes uh, a little bit of her time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so sad. Of course, Will Wheaton, of course, does the tabletop podcast on her network, which is a lot of fun if you like uh, board games. You get to meet uh, Will and all his friends. You might recognize some of them. He's Netflix, got a lot of celebrity you can watch, friends. Uh, yeah, you can watch the Guild. They're in the Guild together. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you're, a, I'm, I'm a reformed uh, World of Warcraft player. I'm, uh, I cut that. I think I got my uh, two-year coin the other day. Cold turkey. You know, I, I've ne I've never actually played World of Warcraft. Not because I didn't want to, but because I thought if I start playing this game, you will never see me again. <laughs> It's a time vampire, so I don't have time. Eh, what can you do? Thank you so much, guys. Jeff Gurner, it's been uh, a blast talking to you. Hopefully you'll come back. I know we ran so long today, but I uh, really apologize for that. But it's Anytime. Been a, My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Sir Jimmy, how you doing? Doing Press great. Island. Thanks for coming, Jeff. Absolutely. You got the Padre dancing in the background. <laughs> woo -woo. <laughs> I don't know who we got next week, but it's going to be fun, whoever it is. <laughs> we should tease I'll next week more. <laughs> you know what? Stay tuned. Tune in next week. You find out who's coming. <laughs> same book time, same book channel. Stay tuned, book readers and book listeners. Paul the Book Guy will be back next week. Same book time, same book channel.
You know, and just because this was on my iPad, LeVar Burton singing Reading Rainbow. <laughs> Sam Lloyd. Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book. 